You're listening to Teach Me the Bible podcast, where we unpack the meaning of books, passages, and themes from Scripture. Join us each week as Dr. David Klingler walks us through God's Word and teaches the Bible. Each episode has a study guide available in the show notes. This is Teach Me the Bible podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to Teach Me the Bible podcast. Uh, Today we are in chapter 7 of the book of Hebrews. So we are, um, we're trekking along right through the book and uh, we're starting to see the simplicity of the author's argument uh, in these two choices, these two paths, either be carried along to maturity or fall into the hands of a disciplining God. And and, uh, if, if that sounds very unfamiliar to you, then I'll encourage you to go back and listen to these first six chapters, but uh, we're going to press on with this argument as we kind of get into this high priest um, discussion with Christ here in chapter seven. So you want to lead us through it? Yeah, so we just jump right in. Uh, So continuing, uh, ends chapter six with uh, according to the order of Melchizedek. And and of course, he's, he's introduced this Psalm 110 order of Melchizedek all the way back very early uh, in, uh, in, in his, in his letter, all the way back in chapter one, uh, verse 13, sit in my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So he's already been in Psalm 110 and uh, developing this high priest, uh, this priest that, that sits at the right hand of the father until the enemies are a footstool for his feet, Mm -hmm. according to the order of Melchizedek. That's that's uh, in uh, in Psalm one one ten, and so this Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us. We finished the uh, last week with that verse. That's six twenty, that he's run the he's a pre runner. He's he's run the race already, mm-hmm. uh, and now the race is set before mm-hmm. uh, before he's the, gotten to the completion or the yes, perfection language. That's right. That we're talking about. Yeah, uh, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, what's the point that he's going to make here? He's saying that. Uh, he's been talking about the Aaronic priesthood and and how the high priest in the Old Testament, uh, he had to carry the sins of the people and had to carry his own sins, but not so with Jesus. Jesus didn't have his own sin to carry. Uh, and uh, and so the, the work of the Old Testament high priest was never done. The priest never sat down, but this mm-hmm. high priest is taking his seat. So this, this Melchizedek uh, high priest, uh, Melchizedek means... Uh, um, uh, Melchizedek, uh, uh, king of righteousness, is what uh, Mel- Melchizedek name, uh, means. And so, for this Melchizedek, this king of righteousness, this king of of peace, king of Salem, king of peace, uh, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham uh, as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth of all of the spoils. Uh, was the first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, uh, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Hmm. He was without father, without mother, without genealogy. Now, what's he talking about here? In the book of Genesis, everybody's got a genealogy. Every, you know where all of these characters came from, mm-hmm. except for Melchizedek. He just walks onto the scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Moses doesn't tell where he came from, who his ancestors were, who his father was, who his mother was. And so the author is making the point here, just as there was no father and mother in the in the Genesis story, so also, so also Christ is, uh, you know, is this no beginning and no end, he, having neither a beginning uh, nor end of days, uh, but made like the Son of God, he abides as a priest perpetually. Now observe how great this man was to whom Abram, the patriarch, gave a tenth of his choice of spoils. Mm. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have a commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people. In other words, the, the, the Melchizedek, Abraham paying to Melchizedek is the standard by which it was the, it was the means by which this gets codified into law. Mm. And so now the believer that follows uh, also pays a tenth to the Levitical priesthood. It's a it's a type. It's a shadow, and that's the language that he's going to use here in hmm. next week in the next in the next chapter. This this paying a tenth was a uh, was a type, a shadow uh, of what was coming. Uh, that is uh, from their brethren, also these who are descended from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced uh, from them collected a tenth from Abraham uh, and blessed the one who had the promises. 
but without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater, right? And so Hmm. the Lord promised back in chapter 6 that he was going to bless Abraham, and the means by which he did it was was Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek brings the blessing, and Melchizedek is the forerunner to Christ. Everything mm-hmm. was looking towards Christ. Uh, the Melchizedekian priesthood is the standard by which the Levitical priesthood is set, at, mm-hmm. at least as far as paying the tithe. Uh, and so his point is that the lesser is blessed by the greater. Uh, and in the case, uh, in this case, mortal men receive tithes. But in the case, uh, but in that case, one receives them of whom it is witness that he lives on, and so to speak, through Abram. Even Levi, uh, who received tithes and paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So in other words, when Abraham paid the tithe to Melchizedek, uh, it was uh, the same as Levi playing, paying the tithe to Melchizedek, and Melchizedek, Melchizedek is a type of Christ. This is mm-hmm. the argument. Uh, for if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, and here's his point, right? Uh, if the, the the story was all about the Levitical priesthood and that was the end-all, be-all, then why was there a forerunner to it? Mm-hmm. And why is there one that's going to come after it? Why does it look towards a greater priest and a greater law? Uh, now, if perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, uh, the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek. In other words, <clears throat> Melchizedek was this great figure that appeared in the story that Abraham paid the tithe to, and Melchizedek bre- blessed Abraham. Mm-hmm. Uh, then the Levitical priesthood comes. The Levitical priesthood was built on the type of Melchizedek in that the the, the tithe mm-hmm. um, was uh, paid to the Levitical priesthood just as Abraham paid uh, Melchizedek. Uh, moreover, the law was given through the Levitical priesthood. But the Levitical priesthood and Psalm 110 looks forward to a greater priest, one according to the order of Melchizedek, who would make payment once for all for sin and sit down at the right hand of the Father, right? Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. so he says, uh, the Levitical priesthood was built on a prior standard, a higher standard, and it looked forward to a later standard, a, mm-hmm. a higher standard. Mm-hmm. Uh, for when the priesthood is changed of of necessity, there takes place a change of law also, All right? So, so we're looking towards a not only a change of priesthood, but a change of law. A greater covenant is what's what's coming. For uh, for the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to the same tribe of which no one is officiated. In other words, uh, the Levitical priesthood is from the line of Levi, but the one that's coming, it is evident that the Lord has descended from Judah, the tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. In other words, there's no Judah priest. Mm -hmm. And this is clearer still if another priest arises according to the likeliness of Melchizedek, who has become um, so it's not on the basis of law of physical requirement, but according to the power of the indestructible life, in other words, resurrection, no beginning, no end. Mm-hmm. Uh, for it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In other words, the story was looking for a priest, not from the line of Judah, but this was to be a messianic king priest mm-hmm. like uh, Melchizedek. Uh, and, uh, and so a change is necessary. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. That's important to remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, the law made nothing perfect. The priest of the law made nothing perfect, uh, perfect, completed, completed, brought it to its right. end. Right, Which is said earlier in chapter 11, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, right? yep. it's not. It's not. <laughs> That's right. No, that, yeah, it, and it's through Christ. He is yeah. the RK, the beginner and the completer. Right. right. Uh, for the law made nothing perfect. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And in so much as it was uh, nothing without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he with an oath through the one who said, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a high priest forever. And so what's his point here? Uh, there's no swearing in, no oath 
from the Lord of the Levitical priesthood, but of this one there is. Mm-hmm. The Lord, this is the Lord's doing. So much more also Jesus having becoming the guarantee of a better covenant. And the former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater number because they were prevented by death from continuing. They, mm-hmm. they, they you know, there's one, then another, and another, the whole Levitical priesthood. But he, on the other hand, because he abides forever without beginning, without end, holds his priesthood permanently. Hence, also, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him. He always lives to make intercession for them. Hmm. It, was for, it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, that does not need the, the, the daily like those other high priests to offer sacrifices first for his own sins, then for the sins of the people, because he did it once for all when he offered up himself. Mm-hmm. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath, the word of the Lord, which came after the law appoints the son mm-hmm. to be priest forever, to be, to make perfect forever. He is the the beginner and the completer of our faith. So, so the the author of Hebrews is making the point from every means possible mm-hmm. that Jesus is the end all be all of the Old Testament. Everything pointed to Him. The law didn't make you clean. Uh, he's going to say uh, here coming up: the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. The priest couldn't take away sin. Only this one could take away sin. Uh, and so. We have a greater high priest. Now, why is this important? Because this uh, this Jew who's a believer in Christ is contemplating going back to the Old Testament, going back to Old Testament law, going back to the Old Testament Levitical priesthood, going back to the Old Testament revelation and covenant. Um, and the the author's point is everything about that Old Testament, the angels, the word which was given, was talking about Christ. Uh, the Moses was the one through whom the law was given, and mm-hmm. he managed the house. But Christ was the house. But Christ was the house, mm-hmm. and God is the builder of the house. And uh, and the Levitical priesthood was was necessary, but it was inferior to the Melchizedekian priesthood uh, that preceded it, uh, and it looked forward to a priesthood that would come after it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, if this was the end all be all, the Old mm-hmm. Testament then why was it looking for another? Why was it looking for a greater rest? Why was it looking for a greater covenant? Why was it looking for a greater yeah. Moses? Why was it looking for a greater priesthood? All yeah. of it. And why couldn't it carry you to completion? To completion. Right. That's exactly right. right. And, and, so, uh, and so in chapter 8, he's going to say, the main point of what I've been saying is this. <laughs> and so if you're reading chapters 1 through 7, and you don't get to the point that he's making in chapter eight, mm-hmm. then you need to go back and read it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and not only is it is chapter eight where he's headed, but then he's going to chapter nine, where he's going to talk about the the old, uh, you know, the old sanctuary, the old sacrifices, the old mm-hmm. covenant, and the new covenant, mm-hmm. uh, the new covenant sacrifices. Chapter uh, ten, he's going to uh, uh, t- to talk about how this. Uh, you know this this uh, you know this Christ could take away sin, and we need to hold fast to that confession. Then he's going to go into all the examples. Look at all, consider all the saints in the Old Testament who never received what was promised, but looked forward to the day when they would be perfected. Mm-hmm. And so uh, he's going to finish chapter eleven with this: uh, that um, all of these, all of these saints, having uh, gained approval from God through their faith did not receive what was promised. In other words, they were not perfected because God had providing something better for us so that apart from us, they should not be made perfect, not should, should not be made completed, perfected. And that's where this whole story is going. Mm-hmm. This whole letter is going is, is towards perfection. So therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, um, and every example that I could come up with, says the writer, <laughs> endure, <laughs> run. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you're going to fall into the discipline of the Lord, mm-hmm. and that will not go well for you. Right. Um, and so, so we're just putting this whole book together. Uh, and then in chapter 13, he's going to finish and say, all right, so, so you got it. 
uh, you have a ministry, uh, go, you know, carry this message to your uh, fellow uh, brethren, your Jewish brethren. Be useful. And, yeah, <laughs> and be useful. Yeah, don't, <laughs> yeah. Be, don't be fruitless. Yeah. Don't yield thorns and thistles, but yield, uh, you know, valuable, uh, you know, fruit, a fruit, valuable response. Uh, and uh, and so we we're going to get into chapter thirteen with mm-hmm. a bunch of imperatives, and yeah. so that's that's how this book's going to going to spell out and fin- uh, you know play out and finish yeah. out. Well, just as we said last time, you know, once again struck by the simplicity of the argument, and yeah. what I mean by that is the logic which he's using. It's it's really he's making a very simple point, and he's using all these illustrations. But what makes it easier to understand is knowing the Old Testament yes. and knowing the illustrations which he's using, and so. Um, so if, if that's not you, if you feel like you don't know the Old Testament, uh, we have all kinds of resources. You know, we want to sort of point you back because we recognize that um, some of these illustrations, might you, you might not have ever heard of Melchizedek before. You might not have ever right. heard of the Levitical priesthood or whatever. So yep. um, we'll point you back to, we have a whole Bible in a year series. That's a good start. We'll point you back to that if you haven't already listened to it. Go back, listen to the Bible in a year and, and continue to look out for more resources because we're going to go through Old Testament books and and, right. and continue to hash these things right. out, then uh, we're confident that as you keep plugging in, as you keep um, uh, learning, that the, these things will become more and more clear yeah. to you. So, And, and don't forget that um, that you're, we're in the gen- this is a general epistle by general epistle. The general epistles are written to a Jewish audience. Right. Uh, James is written to a Jew, you know, Hebrews, 1 Peter. Uh, the the Jews knew the old, their old covenant. They mm-hmm. they knew their their Old Testament Bible. Right. Um, and and so the the way that you would argue with someone who already knows this stuff was grown up by it would be very different mm-hmm. than uh, trying to explain something to a Gentile who doesn't know anything. Right. Which is generally speaking why we like the Pauline epistles because they're written to Gentiles who don't know anything. Yeah. And so he kind of puts it on the it out. Yeah, yeah he puts it on the bottom shelf yeah. for yeah. the readers. Um, whereas uh, the assumed shared knowledge mm-hmm. between the author and audience in these letters written to Jews, written probably by a Jew to a Jew. Um, there's a there's much higher Old Testament uh, prerequisite knowledge yeah. needed. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, so yeah, go check out those resources and, uh, and then join us back here uh, next week for Chapter 8. We'll see you then. Thanks for listening to Teach Me the Bible podcast. Our desire is to use the power of God's Word to change lives. For more information, download our app. Join us next week for another episode of Teach Me the Bible.